end of the semester. Um, so try to uh, put that to the side for a short block of time. Um, welcome everyone to the fifth and final event of the USF SWIG program, Jewish Studies and Social Justice, fall 2016 semester. For tonight, we have the opportunity to learn and hear from writer, poet, artist, and teacher, Andrew Raymond, who will discuss his newest book, Torah Told Different, Stories for a Pan-Poly Post-Denominational World. Founded in 2008, the USF Jewish State and Social Justice Program is the first and only program in the history of the United States formally linking Jewish studies with social justice. In addition to offering numerous courses related to this interdisciplinary field, we offer a minor in JSSJ, as well as a number of events. Uh, in the spring, we have a number of exciting events lined up, including our seventh annual social justice lecture run in partnership with the JCC, the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco, where we will hear from Stash Kotler, the CEO of arguably the most important Jewish social justice organization working on domestic American issues, Bend the Ark. We will also launch a new JSSJ program uh, being run in partnership with the annual USF Global Women's Rights Forum that will focus on art and activism as related to sexual violence on college campuses. In addition, we'll offer a new three-part series related to Christian-Jewish relations and our eighth annual Social Justice Passover Seder. If you're interested in being put on our listserv, there's a sign-up sheet towards the entrance. Special thanks for tonight. This performance goes to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. Now, to begin tonight's program officially. Many of the most pressing issues of the 21st century are those humans have been grappling with for centuries. Ideas such as right and wrong, justice and injustice, and responsibility. The most recent presidential election has for some unveiled, and for others merely reiterated, the monumental work that still needs to take place in this country in relation to social justice. It says in a sacred Jewish text called the Mishnah that we are not required to finish the work, but neither are we permitted to abstain from doing our part. We live in this nexus between what is and what could be, the world all around us and the world in its ideal form. Tonight's speaker lives in this prophetic restlessness. He lives in the tension between particularism and universalism. He maintains particular social identities like all of us, and he has a shared connection to the human collective, per perhaps above all else. Andrew Raymer was born in Queens, New York in 1951, across the street from an amusement park called Fairyland. The nurses in the hospital wrapped him in a yellow blanket and sent him home to a, familiar, to a family of talkers, readers, storytellers, and prolific fabricators who shared their love of words with him. Drawing and painting were his first loves. He was read to every night and soon became a constant reader. But it wasn't until his third grade teacher recited Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Bells, that it occurred to him that he could be a writer himself. Enthralled by the way Poe made music with words, he went home to write his first poem, certain of his path. Is this true? This journey has taken him through fairy tales, mythology, archaeology, books on slavery, Native American spirituality, Russian novels, all of Jane Austen, Doris Lessing's Canopus books, Jane Robert Seth's books, and Nachman of Bratislav's stories. Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, and Sufi texts have fed him, along with the Jewish stories he heard growing up, the Jewish books he devoured, and the queer stories he had to intuit until they started to be told around him. His writing embodies a range of voices, some his own, some received, a term he prefers to channel. His styles vary. He writes long novels and very, very short stories. His published work includes the critically acclaimed and best-selling book on angels, as well as pieces in gay erotic anthologies. More recently, he has served the USF community as a professor in the Jewish Studies and Social Justice program and was ordained as a Magid, a sacred storyteller. His most acclaimed book prior to Torah Told Different is called Querying the Text, Biblical, Medieval, and Modern Jewish Stories. 
His primary interests are in multi-faith engagement, the sacredness of the body, and the human connection to the earth. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Andrew Raymer, Magid Raymer, who will share with us his latest written creation, Torah Told Different. So I have to put this object down so that I can retrieve another object. This object. So, and then it's going to go away. So I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I love the school. I love the conversations that go on here. I love the way that I've been fed as a writer, as a poet, as a storyteller. And I think basically of all of my work as some version of bedtime stories for grown-ups. So I hope that all of you were read to as kids. Uh, if you weren't, have someone read to you now. And if you're thinking of having kids, read to them all the time because it's an incredible gift. And so what I basically want to do is give you a tiny little bit of background verbally and then just read to you. And uh, if you fall asleep, I will be honored. That's the job of a good bedtime story. And then I'll just slip out at the end. <laughs> so I love the cover of this book, and it happened by the random chance of friends taking me off to meet a friend of theirs who owned an art gallery that I recommend you all go to because they have gorgeous stuff. It's on 40th and Taraval. It's called Far, Far Out Gallery. And it's this randomness of how things happen that I think is part of the work of a storyteller, of integrating the events that happen, the images that happen. And I think, as Professor Ron Tapper said, my, my life has been determined by the stories around me. So I was indeed born right across the street in Elmhurst, Queens, New York, from an amusement park called Fairy. And my great delight, 65 and a half years later, is that in March I moved to Oakland, and then I live up the street from an amusement park called Fairyland. So whatever anyone may determine about the genetic components of what makes for gayness and queerness, I think that they would have to factor in proximity to amusement parks, which hasn't come up in any DNA studies that I've read about. So. The other piece of my story that shapes my work and possibly why I would end up writing a book called Torah Till Different is that my father's family were extremely observant Orthodox Jews in Brooklyn. And right around the corner were my mother's family who were extremely devout communist Jews. So I say that I was raised in two faith traditions simultaneously the militant non and anti believers, and right around the corner the believers. And so that schizoid experience of living into reality simultaneously prepared me for many other things. And it wasn't fun as a kid, but I'm grateful to it now. So the first chapter in this book will possibly already tell you something about what the book is about, because the first chapter is called Twice Upon a Time. <laughs> So if you hear nothing else other than that, and you grew up with stories about once upon a time, I needed to deconstruct that right off. So twice upon a time. Now the big challenge is that if I uh, read, uh, I have to put my glasses on. If I put my glasses on, I can't see you. So nap, rest, relax. I will try to have my voice project across the room, even though I can no longer see you. So this is the beginning of Twice Upon a Time. The Torah begins with two entirely different creation stories. The first one starts with chaos, then moves in a stately fashion toward God declaring that everything he created is tov ma'od, very good. Conversely, 
The second story begins in an orderly fashion and ends with the painful expulsion of the first two human beings from the Garden of Eden. I understand this duality. I understand Eden and the loss of Eden. When I was small, Eden was our backyard. I had my first spiritual experience there when I was five, lying on the warm grass beneath a bank of honeysuckle blossoms with my best friend Jamie. Sunlight was streaming down through the branches of two large trees, a horse chestnut and a pin oak. Bees were buzzing all around us, and all at once I knew, knew in a deep, embodied way, that just as the bees were dipping in and out of those sweet, fragrant blossoms over and over again, that everything that exists comes from and goes back to a something that I did not think to call God that day. I had my first experience of radical disconnection a year later, lying on the grass by myself, looking up at the sky, when by blinking, I discovered that each of my eyes was a slightly different color. More what I call blue with my right eye and gray with my left. Discovering that thrust me out of Eden, out of unity, by shattering the innate connection I've been living in between words, the world, and my experience of it. Roses are red, violets are blue, but which red, which blue? To this day, I prefer the blue sky of my right eye and the green grass of my left. My Jewish education also consists of two different stories, one happening right after the other. My first Hebrew school teachers were all women who taught us wonderful stories about the mythical beasts on Noah's Ark and about Abraham breaking his father Terah's idols. But when we were old enough to start learning Hebrew, our teachers were suddenly all men, and I was stunned and saddened as we began to read the Torah itself because the stories I loved weren't there, just the bare bones of them. Later I learned that those stories about stories <coughs> that I first heard and fell in love with are called midrashim, inquiries, investigations. And to this day, I prefer those Baroque explorations to the bony versions we find in the written Torah. From the beginning of our reading of Genesis, all of us, girls and boys alike, noticed who was missing from the text. We read that Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel and then Seth, and we understood that. But when we read that Cain and Seth had children, all of us asked if there was no one else in the world but them and their parents, who were their wives? Who were the mothers of their children? The answer we were given by our male, and I must say orthodox teachers, was in other midrash. Each of them was born with a twin sister. Even as a boy, I wondered, why didn't the Torah just say that? And we wondered too, why did Jacob have so many sons and only one daughter? But there was no midrash for that. Twice upon a time. We were taught that Moses received not one, but two Torahs from God, one written and one oral. And when we came to the second and different version of the Ten Commandments, we were taught another Midrash, the lovely one. And you may notice that the two of them are somewhat different. So this is the Midrash. The, the children of Israel heard God stating both of them at the very same time, an oral version of my visual experience, to becoming one. I miss you. I have to look a little bit. <laughs> 
So I love to retell stories. That's my job. That's, I think, what I was genetically programmed to do. And I love to tackle text, which I invite everyone to do, whether or not anyone told you you have permission to do it, just tackle text. So thinking about what was missing from the text, I decided that I would start the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible earlier than it starts. So it begins with Genesis chapter one, and then it goes on, and I decided that I would write Genesis chapter zero. So this is chapter zero, verse one. Before God began to create anything, before there was heaven or earth, night or day, good or bad, in or out, up or down, God said, I must create myself. Chapter 0, verse 2. And in the vast, limitless nothingness of its allness, and that's it with a capital I, and in the vast, limitless nothingness of its allness with no borders or boundaries, no direction and no distinctions in its infinite, eternal self, God said, let there be me. Chapter 0, verse 3. Then God stirred and stretched and shrank and striped and sighed and surged until she became who he is. And her isness is who he always was and always will be in the midst of her sacred unfolding. And God called himself whole and saw that everything and saw everything that was possible from her radiant wholeness. And there was some one, and there was some when. And from that some when, God was finally ready to begin to create a some where. And then hopefully some of you know what happens next. Um, in the beginning, God created, but I thought, so what comes before? This is a question. Any of you physicists studying physics? This question fascinates me. If I was to do my life all over again, I would either be um, a modern dancer or a physicist. But what happened before creation intrigues me. And when one of you figures it out, come find me. So, when I was a kid, and maybe you did, I grew up on these stories of Noah's Ark. Did any of you grow up on Noah's Ark stories? And did any of you have a little, like I had a plastic ark that had little animals in it and it was fun to play with. And uh, I decided that I needed to retell that story. So in, in the Torah, Noah's wife, doesn't have a name, as lots of women don't have names, but there are several ancient Jewish texts that name her. There's a book that I love and adore, which is called the Book of Jubilees. Book of Jubilees is not in the Hebrew Bible. It is not in the Catholic, uh, Greek Orthodox, Armenian, Coptic, anybody's Bibles. It is in the Ethiopian Christian Bible. And in the Book of Jubilees, which is an ancient Jewish text, Noah's wife is called Emzara. So I have named her that. And they have named all of their daughters, very, very, and all of their daughters-in-law, Noah and his wife, very long names that I have contracted. So I've given them nicknames. So the nicknames in here I took from text. The people in the world got worse and worse. They damage the soil, they harm the plants and animals, and they so ruin the weather that the seasons were thrown off, and it began to rain all the time. Someone invented the umbrella and became the world's first millionaire. Others grew rich making raincoats and waterproof boat, boots, and everyone went about their business as if nothing was the matter, except for a single man who decided to build a boat. A boat just big enough for his family to fit in, his family, and a few of all the animals in the world, which they did. Every morning when he got up, listening to the rain that battered above them and the waves that crashed beneath them, 
Noah would stretch and look around and smile. I am a clever man, he would say to himself. And I am here alive and well with my dear wife and Zara and our wonderful boys and their wonderful wives. Then he would thank God for saving them, and whistling, he would get up and join M. Zara in the small galley where she was already preparing the morning meal. Every morning, M. Zara and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, would wake and stretch, and listening to the batter and rain and the crashing waves, think, we are such lucky boys to still be alive because we are the cleverest sons of a clever father. And their wives, Sedek, Nilat, and Adat, smuggled close to their husbands for warmth in their narrow skulls, would wake and think, listening to the battering rains and the crashing waves. We are such lucky girls to still be alive because we married the clever sons of a clever man. And the sons and their wives would join in Zara and Noah for their morning meal of stored grains and milk and eggs taken from the animals on board. And when they were done, they would thank the one who would preserve them. And with Noah still whistling, they would all go off to do their morning tasks of feeding the animals and cleaning up after them, except for Adat, who was often seasick or pretending to be, her sisters in law suspected. Every morning after breakfast, M. Zara would clean up, and then she would wander from the top to the bottom of the ark, checking on the animals, petting, grooming, and comforting them, trapped in their tiny stalls. As the ship surged and tilted, all of them tore by the battering rain above and the crashing waves beneath their fragile home. When the rain stopped, when the waters receded, the ark finally came to rest on the top of a windswept mountain and the eight of them emerged into the blinding light of a cloudless day, leading the animals out two by two, who dashed, ran, raced, soared, slithered, slinked, ambled, and crawled off to find new homes. And Noah and his sons, and all their wives descended from that lonely mountain, and they thanked God for their salvation, and offered sacrifices. And Emzara, looking around them at the twisted trees, the mangled bodies of animals and humans scattered everywhere in the mud, thought to herself, I knew that no good would come from being trapped in that awful floating prison. No, I wish that I had died with my parents and my sisters and their husbands and all of their children. How are you doing? Should I keep reading? Would you rather go to ancient Alexandria or modern San Francisco? Alexandria? San Francisco. Okay, we're going to San Francisco. Uh, this might be one of my favorite stories in the book. It's called Sadie's Same Old Shabbat. And I wrote this story a number of years ago for a friend. I was working at the Jewish Community Center, and the rabbi who was the educator came in, and I was the librarian, came into the library and with a stack of kids' picture books on Shabbat, and he said, there's not a single book here about any of the kids who come here. They have observant religious families, they keep kosher, none of the kids here do. Don't you have any books that are about us and who we are? And I said, I don't think so. And then I went home and wrote the story. Which, so you have to imagine this is actually a children's picture book that snuck into a, a, a book of bedtime stories for grown-ups. Or not. Sadie's same old Shabbat. Sadie was sprawled out on the floor of her bedroom playing a video game when her mother Ruthie called her from down the hall. Sadie, it's almost Shabbat. Will you polish the silver? 
Sadie pushed herself up from the floor with a frown and a groan and said to herself out loud, it's always the same old Shabbat. And she shuffled down the hallway to the kitchen. And I'm always the one to do the polishing. Sadie's mother was stirring a big pot on the stove, humming to herself. Sadie, do you know where the polish is? Her mother asked. Sadie sighed, yes I do, mommy. As she knelt and took the silver polish from underneath the sink. And then an old rag. Her grandmother's silver Shabbat candlesticks were on the table, right where her mother always put them every week after she set the table. Kneeling on her chair, Sadie went to work. Rag in hand, she rubbed and buffed and made the first candlestick shiny again. Just as she set it down, the phone rang. I'll get it, Sadie said, jumping off her chair. Who was it? Her mother asked a minute later. Who else? Aunt Deb calling from their car to say that she and Auntie Aunt Rita and the twins are running late again. Sadie was putting the short white Shabbat candles in the candlesticks when the doorbell rang. I have to check the chicken. Will you get it, Sadie? Her mother asked, leaning over to open the oven door. Yeah, I'll get it, Sadie mumbled and took off down the hallway, muttering to herself, it's either Grandpa Sam and Akuya or Uncle Bernie. Nothing ever changes around here. It's always the same old Shabbat. Who is it? Sadie called through the door. It's us, came a very familiar voice. Unlocking the door, Sadie led in her grandfather and his girlfriend, Akuya, who he met three years before at the Jewish Community Center in a senior swimming class. Grandpa Sam was leaning on his walker. Okuyo was carrying a big pink box tied with white string, filled with pastries from her favorite Mexican bakery. Every week she brings the same old thing, Sadie thought to herself as her grandfather leaned down to kiss her on the cheek and hug her. Just as Sadie was about to lock the door, she heard a familiar shuffling down the hall that meant that Uncle Bernie was there too, a big shopping bag in each hand. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe the trouble I had finding a parking space. I had to circle the block four times, and then I found one right around the corner, and I was about to. Sadie sighed. It was always the same thing with her Uncle Bernie, who wasn't really her uncle, but her mother's cousin and best friend, going all the way back to their childhood in Brooklyn. You couldn't even say hello to us, her grandfather said. Sorry, Grandpa Sam. Sorry, Akuyu. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom. So anyway, I was just about to pull in when Sadie slid her arm behind her to lock the door, turning him out again, tuning him out again, as he and her grandfather and Akuya went down the hall. So where are Deborah and I'm reading the twins? Akuya asked, as she did every Shabbat. Sadie's mother is carrying bowls of soup to the table as they all came to the er, so, Sadie's mother was carrying bowls of soup to the table as they all came into the kitchen. My sister called to say they're running late again. Everyone seemed surprised, but Sadie said to herself, every Friday night, it's always the same story. What's wrong with all of you grown-ups? Haven't you noticed? Here, let me help you with the soup, Kuyu offered, Kuyu offered Ruthie. As Grandpa Sam settled down at the table, and Uncle Bernie began pulling food out from his two shopping bags. Sadie winced as for the millionth time, tossed spinach salad with tangerine slices in it, Dish made of string beans and sliced almonds made their appearance. Not on the tablecloth, Bernie, use a trivet. Sadie's mother cried out, Ruthie, it's cool already. I've done this every week since Sadie was a baby, and have I ever once burned your mother's tablecloth? Bernie answered back. Sadie groaned. At least he knows it. It's the same Shabbat week after week after week. Everyone settled in around the table. How long should we wait for them? Her grandfather asked, as he always did. A few minutes more, Ruthie answered, as she brought the last soup bowl over and took her seat. Sadie remembered a time before her parents split up when her father was still at the table. Even though he wasn't Jewish, he never quite did figure out what Shabbat was all about. But even then, it was the same old Shabbat. So we'll wait another minute. If they don't come, we'll light the candles, 
Sadie's grandfather said as he did each week. And just as her mother was reaching for the matches in their little silver box that Uncle Bernie brought back from Israel, the doorbell rang. Sadie jumped down and ran to the door. Aunt Deb and Auntie Armrita were standing there hand in hand, with Jonah and Jasmine, their twins, standing in front of them. Her aunts both leaned out to kiss her, one on each cheek, just as they did every Shabbat. Grandpa, Grandpa. The twins ran, pushing their way into the house, just as they always did. Locking the door again, Sadie and her aunts headed back down the hallway to the kitchen to see Grandpa Sam hugging the twins and pulling them up in his lap, as he did every week. I apologize, Auntie Deb said to her sister. It was all my fault. We got tired of bringing the same old challah, so we decided to surprise everyone. But I forgot to preheat the oven when I got home from work, which is why we're late. Sadie almost cried out loud, you're always late. When her auntie arm reader reached into the large white plastic container she was carrying and with a flourish pulled out a tall stack of dark brown flatbreads. Fresh from the griddle and aren't they beautiful, Aunt Deb said. We help make them, the twins shouted in unison, but Sadie was very quiet. They're from a recipe for Shabbat chapatis that my grandmother brought with her from India to Israel, Amrita added. They look delicious, Grandpa Sam said, as Amrita put them in the center of the table on the challah plate, and then put the blue and white embroidered challah cover over them, the one that they used every week. I can't wait to taste them, Uncle Bernie said. They look just like the bread in that Indian restaurant Carlos and I used to go to every weekend until right before he died. What's the matter, honey? Sadie's mother asked her daughter, looking over the white candles, the salad and string beans, the steaming bowls of chicken soup with noodles swimming through them, over the challah cover that her mother Sadie had embroidered, her own Sadie was named for, to the opposite end of the table where Sadie sat. In her chair, her face contorted, holding back her tears. Sadie, sweetheart, we all miss your Uncle Carlos. Mommy, I hate AIDS, and I miss Uncle Carlos all the time, but it isn't that. There to be chapatis, even special Shabbat chapatis. I want us to have plain old challah, just like we do every week. And you, and me, and Grandpa Sam, and Akuyo, and Uncle Bernie, and Aunt Deb, and Auntie Amrita, and Jasmine, and Jonah, saying the blessings over the candles and the grape juice instead of wine because Uncle Bernie is in recovery, but we're not supposed to talk about it. And for a moment, everyone was silent, and one by one, they all began to laugh. Even Sadie was laughing. I want Shabbat to be the same, Mommy, just like I want it to be the same when you read me a bedtime story. So Sadie's mother, Ruthie, stood up to light the Shabbat candles and lead them in the blessings, just like she did at the beginning of every Shabbat. And Bernie stood up to lead them in the blessing over the grape juice, just like he did every Friday night. Then Deb and Amrita and the twins stood up to say the blessing over the chapatis, just like they did each week over a challah, now tearing off pieces of the steaming chapatis and passing them around the table. And everyone really liked the Shabbat chapatis, even Sadie, who asked for another piece, then another, and another. How you doing? You can stretch, 30 more stories, you doing okay? <laughs> Um, this story is called The Trial of Trials. The requisite period of rehabilitation had, did nothing, had done nothing to change him. So reported the therapist assigned to work with him. A second round was equally disappointing, as was a third. No repentance, no remorse. His team of angelic therapists informed their superiors. According to the laws of heaven, after three such rounds, the accused is ordered to stand trial. His court appearance began in an orderly fashion. 
the defending and prosecuting angels gave their opening statements. Then, as is customary in heaven, the defendant had the opportunity to speak. Standing, a steely look in his eyes, Adolf Hitler turned to the judge, and that's judge with a capital J. Adolf Hitler turned to the judge and said, I have seen down on earth how since my death my name has been used to stand for evil itself when men like Stalin and Mao were responsible for far more deaths than I was, but are viewed as defective rather than demonic. And ultimately I say to you, capital Y, and here he pointed directly at the judge, capital J, his voice grown shrill, that it's you who ought to be on trial for creating a world in which a soul like mine could be born. With that, the courtroom burst into a cacophony of voices, of thousands of angels raised, rising to their seats, wings flapping madly, a mockery, an outrage proof itself. There should be no trial, just sentencing when his guilt is so apparent. Such shouts and cries went on and on, ignoring the repeated calls for silence, till at last the judge ordered the courtroom cleared of all visitors and declared the trial would be sealed from that point on. Finally, the judge, the defending and prosecuting angels, a single recording angel and Hitler himself, sat mutely in the vast, still, golden chamber. And ever patient, sitting on a small rise, the judge waited till the very last echoes faded from the room, till the shout and flutter of departing angels had faded, then the judge went on. Herr Hitler, rest assured that in spite of the unusual circumstances of your case and the recent unfortunate outbreak in this courtroom, that we shall not, as has been called for, grant a decision in these matters without a formal trial. And please be reminded that in spite of everything, and I am not oblivious to the merits of your argument, that I have given you all free will, and whatever my possible failings in your eyes, sir, it is you who are on trial today for your actions on earth. You, sir, and not me. You, sir, and no one else. To those words from the judge, Hitler had neither comment nor visible response. He remained sitting stony cold in the defendant's box. The judge turned to the defending angel who rose with dark purple wings pulled close against its back. Your Honor, the defendant has, in a prior deposition, acknowledged his full involvement in all of the events that he's on trial for. This is an unusual action in a hearing such as this, and I would like to mention it to his credit. The defending angel turned toward the blue-winged recording angel as it entered those words on a long silver scroll. And I have already submitted documents to the court proving the deprivation of my client's childhood, the abuse he endured, and its lasting effect on his meditation. The judge nodded thoughtfully, and the defending angel, turning back to its seat, let the court know, I have nothing further to say at this moment. The prosecuting angel stood and flared its large orange wings with a sudden snap. Hitler jerked in his seat and then brought his body under control. Moving toward the judge's stand, the prosecuting angel said, Your Honor, my worthy companion here would like us to believe that his client's admission of responsibility is worthy of mention and that the abuse he endured ought to elicit from us compassion and in some twisted way not just explain, but even excuse his heinous actions. But from my point of view, admission without any feeling of horror at the crimes he committed, without even the slightest hint of regret, let alone repentance, is both a mockery of his innate humanity and a mockery of this court. Having said that, it paused. Seated in silence, the judge nodded to the prosecuting angel who continued, Your Honor, at this time I would like to enter into the records my evidence. The angel continued, 
Mr. Hitler, rather than reiterate all the crimes that you have been charged with, which are common knowledge in heaven and down below, I have chosen to approach this part of the trial from a different angle. Here, it turned to the defendant. In a moment, in the air in front of you, a series of faces will appear, each one lasting for a single minute in Earth time. Each face will be that of another human victim of your heinous regime. These victims, men, women, and children lost their lives not because you lived, but because of how you lived. Hitler sneered, or so it seemed to the recording angel, as the prosecuting angel went on. I have one further stipulation before entering this evidence into the proceedings, that you look at each face for the full minute that it's shown. If you fail to do so, the face will remain visible till such time as you have allowed it to register on your consciousness. The face, the very human face of a soul that was deprived of its chosen embodiment because of you. And let me remind you that there are 525,600 minutes in a standard Earth year. You can do the math, Mr. Hitler, if you want to know how long these faces will appear before you. Here, the defending angel rose and snapped out his own dark wings. Your honor, no one here will deny the crimes committed by my client, but we must not forget that he was himself the victim of higher horrifying neglect, abuse, violence from the time of his birth. Many are wounded on earth, my dear colleague, the prosecuting angel said, but few turn into such monsters as your client. Your honor, my worthy companion in this courtroom is making judgments about my client before this hearing is concluded. The judge nodded. Your point is noted. And given that earth time is linear and heaven time is fluid and expansive, let it suffice to say that Adolf Hitler's trial is still going on in one of countless heavenly courtrooms, each presided over by the same one judge. Alas, it's a closed trial. And since only the facts about the opening of the trial were released to the celestial press, I cannot tell you anything else about the proceedings, Mr. Hitler's response to the images, or tell you anything about how long this trial may last. Some say, all this time later, that Hitler is still looking at the very first image. stories in the book. It's called The Book of Elias, or In the Water at Babylon. So you may know the biblical reference by the waters of Babylon. We will. Anyone else here from Long Island? Anyway, there's a town on Long Island, New York, that's called Babylon. It was on the train line that I grew up taking as a kid. So this is my um, tribute to Long Island and water. Elias Nakamura, a doctoral student in archaeology who lives in Babylon, New York, was relaxing in a hot tub after a long day at work. A single candle was burning on the sink, and a CD was playing softly Bach's cello suites, his favorite music. Suddenly, the small, blue-tiled upstairs bathroom was filled with a nearly blinding white-gold light. And in the midst of the light, a figure was standing right in front of the bathroom door. 
Oh my God, Elias thought to himself, I'm hallucinating from chronic sleep deprivation. A sudden wave of self-disappointment swept through him, common to many who were struggling to finish their dissertations after working on them for almost nine years. May that be none of your fates. Then he said to himself, but I'm a scientist. I might as well continue to observe this. And he turned to the figure standing in the midst of the light. The figure in the light came closer and said to him, I am God, Elias, come to you today with a message for the world. Now, Elias hadn't meant to. No, that isn't quite right. Elias wished he hadn't, at least not out loud, burst into laughter, but he did. He began to laugh, both at the strangeness of the situation, lying naked in a tub of hot water, and at the strangeness of being spoken to by an indistinct but nonetheless human figure which was standing in the middle of his bathroom, in the midst of a light so nearly blind you he couldn't tell if the figure was female or male any more than he could from his loud, reverberating, but equally ungendered voice. Elias was laughing out of fear, not fear of God, but fear that he was going crazy. And what was even more crazy was that the figure in the midst of the light, the one that claimed to be God, started laughing too. And soon both of them were laughing so hard that salty tears were streaming down Elias' cheeks and falling like rain into the water. And each time that Elias tried to stop laughing, and he would for a moment, the laughter coming from the figure in the light would get him started all over again. And in the midst of the light, Elias could see that the tears that the figure in the midst of the light was shedding were sparkling, opalescent. And then all at once, they both became very quiet, and the figure in the light addressed him again, this time more formally. I am God, Elias Yukio Wasserman Nakamura come to you today with a message for the world. Laughter was now the very furthest thing from Elias' mind. Fear was far from him, any fear of insanity. The light that filled the room had poured into him with God's words, and that light, as it spread through his body and entered every cell, had miraculously melted away any of his doubts about who was speaking to him. But why me? Elias asked, sitting up on the top. I mean, I'm not religious in any way. God smiled at him. I speak to everyone, Elias, all the time. The interesting question would be, why are you hearing me? Well, that's easy. You don't show up at everyone's bathroom like this. If you did, you could bet that, a lot more, that you would have a lot more friends than you do now. But all of this is so weird. I feel like some kind of prophet from the Bible, only I've never really read it. Except for a few stories, the only year that I went to Hebrew school, and besides, I'm only half Jewish, but I, I guess you already know that. God chuckled. Elias, I have no religion myself. Um, that is a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. God has no religion, or a Mangal quote. God chuckled. Elias, I have no religion myself. And as for the Jewish part, let me say that I was never that fond of Hebrew, if you must know the truth. And I'm glad that you can now talk about me in non-gender terms, beyond the male-female trap that Hebrew forces you into. But frankly, English doesn't go far enough for me. I'm particularly fond of Tagalog and other non-gendered languages, so consider taking them up. This is not, by the way, a command. It's just a suggestion. Commandments are your shtick, not mine. Yeah, sure, but like, why me? Why now? Why like this? I mean, I have wandered between genders my whole life, so that part is fine with me. But why show up looking like some kind of a person at all, standing in the middle of a pool of light? I never thought that you were an old man up in the sky, or an old woman for that matter, but I didn't think you'd be anything like this either. God knew that Elias was a believer and always had been. Since he was little and used to go walking with his mother by the water and kick his feet in the incoming waves, feeling that everything around him, the sand, the seashells, the waves, the sky, the clouds, the little airplane high above trailing vapor behind it, 
and he himself and his mother and their joint hands that everything that is is part of a greater oneness. So in answer to Elias' question, God moved a bit closer, leaned over the tub, and said, do you have any trouble believing that I created the entire universe? Elias shook his head from side to side. Well, if you don't have trouble believing that I can do that, why do you have trouble thinking that I can do this? Elias shut his eyes and sank down into the water. There was a war going on in his mind. Part of him doubted that anything like this could ever happen, not just to him, but to anyone. And then there was another part of him he realized that did not believe that this was really happening. No, it didn't believe it, it just knew that somehow for reasons entirely beyond him, the creator of the universe had chosen to manifest itself in the middle of a cloud of light right there in his bathroom. The moment his mind fully accepted that as the truth, Elias remembered that he was naked. He wanted to slide even further down into the water, but that seemed absurd. The water was clear. And even if he put bubble bath in it, as he sometimes liked to do, and loved to do when he was still the little Eliana known to his family, this was God he was trying to hide from. And besides, he realized the figure in the middle of the light seemed to be naked too, even though he still couldn't tell what gender it was, so why should he feel embarrassed? Stretching down in the tub, now quite at ease with what was happening, Elias looked up at God and said, hey, didn't you come here to tell me something? God laughed again, and even though he didn't know why, Elias started to laugh again too. And they both laughed, another good, long, body-blessing laugh. Then God leaned very close and whispered in Elias' right ear, I already have. Then it was gone, just as suddenly as it had appeared. The light, however, lingered for a while, dancing through Bach's stately notes, illuminating every blue tile, his green towels, so chrome faucets, potted fern on the windowsill, and the map of the world shower curtain pushed back. Then the light faded, leaving Elias in the tub, exactly as he had been 10 minutes before, exactly the same, and at the same time, completely <coughs> different. <coughs> Last little story. It's called The Faith of the Earth. And it repeats a line that is found in an old Jewish text, um, Kephel Vod. Uh, Moses received the Torah from Sinai. Five. <laughs> Oh, one thing I have to say is that I reinvented Jewish history. Oh, this is important for the story. I built and destroyed a third temple in antiquity. Instead of women first being ordained in the 20th century, I had them be ordained in the 5th. And so I invented a number of very ancient women rabbis going back into antiquity. And oh, I invented, how many of you studied the Talmud or read about it in some way? So in, in the world that we live in, there are two. Uh, one from Babylon and one from Jerusalem. I got rid of those in this book. And I have three. Um, and I want to diversify sacred languages. So the background of all of them is Hebrew. But there is the Talmud from Damascus, which is in Aramaic, which the bulk of our Talmuds are. There's the Talmud from Alexandria, which is written in Greek. And there's a Talmud from Rome, which is written in Latin. And so I'm imagining, actually, a future book that I write about conversations between early rabbis and early Christians in the Jewish sacred language of Latin, in my parallel reality. So meanwhile, back to the story. <laughs> Moses received the Torah from Sinai. Why Moses? According to Rabbi Claudia the Elder in the Roman Talmud, it's because he was raised in the house of the daughter of Pharaoh and not with his own people. To remind us that we can do the work of liberation without knowing anything about our people, without knowing anything about our tradition, either. 
Moses received the Torah from Sinai. The rabbis of old did not say, Moses received the Torah from God, nor did they say, Moses received the Torah from God at Sinai. They said that Moses received the Torah from a mountain. Why a mountain and not from God? Because ours is an ancient earth-based faith, its most sacred wisdom given to its prime teacher from a mountain and through a mountain. Is this what the ancient rabbis were thinking? I doubt it. But like all good ancestors, they left us their words as an inheritance, and we are free to do with them as we must, as we will. Moses received the Torah from Sinai, from Mount Shasta, Mount Fuji, Mount Olympus, Mount Kilimanjaro, and Mount Everest, real name Chumalungma, goddess mother of mountains. Like all the sacred mountains in the world are, Moses received the Torah from a mountain and inscribed the sacred words he received on two rocks, just as the Hopi elders and other people have inscribed their sacred words on stone from the earth to preserve them. Moses received the Torah from Sinai, from a mountain, by the ocean, listening to the waves crashing, walking by a stream as it ambles over rocks, at night, looking up at the flaring stars, whipped by wind swirling through the canyons of the city streets. From a dog barking joyfully as you've come through the door, a purring cat curled up in your lap, tenderly from a lover. There we receive Torah, and then we pass it on. And I emailed back and I said, well, I can put the real text in footnotes, but does it make sense to put the fake text in footnotes? And if the fake text isn't in the footnote, but the real text is, and I want them to be parallel, and this wasn't going well, so I took out all the real quotations. And I only left the fake ones. And there were moments, I think I said this before, for me, books begin from leftovers. So this book entirely grew sort of like an irritant a grain of sand in an oyster. It grew from a left out story in my last book, Wearing the Text, that I thought was way too heretical, which was a story about Moses and Joshua becoming lovers. I thought, can't go there. Take out that story. Uh, but I saved it, and it isn't here. Um, and so most of the problems with the publisher was my anxiety. Like, did I go too far this time? And here it is. Um, perhaps they never read it, clearly. <laughs> uh, most of the problems were mine. I don't know if that's the kind of thing that you were looking for. Are you a writer? Uh, I wouldn't say so. Um, that sounds like possibly. Um, <laughs> well, good luck when you have publishers, should you get there. Um, it's always an adventure. But it was a wonderful journey, and a really challenging one. Because I'm venturing out. Recently, I, I was approached through LinkedIn 
by someone who runs a, a clearinghouse for Jewish books. And he wanted to post my book. And when I went to his website, I saw that almost all the other authors that he was publishing were Orthodox Jewish authors. Um, and I said, have you looked at my book? I sent you the PDF of it. Um, he said, no. And so I said, I just want you to know that there are a few problematic stories in this book. <laughs> and um, I listed, I described them a little bit in detail, and he said, thank you for warning me. I think you're right. You're not the right sort of person for me to represent here. So kind of like that. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Uh, anyone else? I think that you can, and in my mind, that's exactly what I was doing. I was reading traditional texts. So I'm reading, you know, Pilkei Avot, and I'm looking at that line, Moses received the Torah. And in fact, I referenced it earlier on in a whole other context, which is, which I can't find out. But yeah, I, I like that. One, with querying the text of the gospel, one of the lovely things was, having somebody email me to say that they were in rabbinic school and they were studying some of my stories parallel to real texts. So yes, I hope that happens. And um, you know, some of it have gone too far, possibly. But someone has to. I could make a comment about our future president, but I won't. <laughs> um, any other questions? Is that a question or a hand moving in the air? Ah, uh, okay. I do that often when I'm not doing things like this. We will now sit in silence. This is meant to answer at 8 o'clock. Just put your feet on the floor and continue well. We will all sit here in silence and meditating until I announce that it's 8 o'clock. Um, and if you don't have any other questions, and you should like to purchase a copy of the book. They're on sale at the back table. There's a postcard of the last book. And I think we're good. Thank you for your question. How do you ordain the Magi? Oh, how did I go to ordain the Magi? Well, in traditional Jewish circles, you know, three rabbis could decide that you are, what's the word in English, rabbi viable and they could ordain you. So I have had multiple friends over the years who have wanted to ordain me as a rabbi. But when that time came close, I thought this would be such a delight to my orthodox relatives and such a horror to my communist relatives. <laughs> and I didn't want to betray them. I felt like I can't buy into that system, although sometimes I've regretted it. So in the community that I belong to, I had multiple rabbis who decided, well, actually, you're a storyteller. You know, you're not such a good scholar, actually. Your language ability is pretty crummy. Um, well, Daniel was a monkey. I thought, oh, that is perfect. It's something, but it's not a rabbi. There are moments where I want to write letters to the editor, and I wish I could write Rabbi Raymer, because I think they would notice it. And that even if I write to Jews and I write Mikey Raymer, no one knows what it is. So, I was moving toward being officially ordained in community, which I was excited about. And in my synagogue, um, on Sunday, the synagogue is actually the first Mennonite church of San Francisco. And one Saturday evening, both uh, a rabbi in that community and the pastor of the Mennonite church happened to be sitting on either side of me after a service. And they knew that this was coming down the pipe. And they looked at each other. And, uh, they said, let's just ordain him right now. And they pulled me up to my feet, and I'm standing in the sanctuary, and the rabbi puts her hands on my head, the pastor puts her hands over my heart, and then in this exquisite moment that I wish on all of you at some point in your life, both of them started saying, as if they had read a script, the same words are coming out of their mouth, like someone's whispering to both of them, angels possibly, the same words. And other people are wandering around the room. It's the end of the service. We are in a bubble of invisibility, which was one of my favorite desired secret powers as a child. 
And then they said the final words, and all this energy is pouring through my body, through their hands. And then they sang the final words, uh, and now you are my key. They took their hands off me, the bubble burst, and someone came up and they're asking questions, and someone asked me if I wanted something from the Onik to eat. And then several months later, the event that was supposed to happen happened in community, and the rabbi and everyone you know, lay hands on me. So that's the story of how I got to be something that no one knows what it is, <laughs> which suits me. So, um, who is the reader that you imagine when you're writing? And I don't know, depending on the, the answer to that, do you ever feel uh, any kind of pressure to represent a certain kind of Jewishness in your writing? Oh, good questions. The, the reader question is interesting. About seven years ago, I got an email from someone who was at the time 14 saying that she had just gotten her first article published um, on the website for young adults. And she wanted to thank me because growing up, her mother had read me stories from one of my books. And I wrote back and said, wow, that's like, incredible. Um, and then I said, could I thank your mom for reading me these stories? And it turned out that his mo her mother has been reading me since, I think, 1982. But I didn't know that. So whenever I just talk about who their perfect reader is, my perfect reader, actually, this woman Eileen, emailed me to say, I'm your perfect reader. So I didn't know that I was writing for this woman Eileen, but apparently I have been. Um, so that's the narrow answer. The bigger answer is um, I'm writing for myself, for the stories that I didn't get to hear, for the stories I want to hear. I'm writing for other people who aren't hearing the stories. I mean, I think for me, writing is an immensely political action. And so to tell a story that changes the given narrative, which is so much, if you study with the professor, of looking at in class what is the dominant narrative, what is the dominant Jewish narrative, I don't have to change it. And, you know, I'm like, I'm sort of this hybrid Jew, I'm Ashkenazi, I'm Sephardi, I'm part Karay, I'm gay. Um, it wasn't, I, there was no way that I was going to just pass for, you know, like a normative Jew, whatever that is. So I was like, just write the stories that you want to write because you're in trouble already. So that's kind of my journey. And did I touch all the points or did I miss one? And I feel like. There may not be people in a hundred years, and sometimes the older they get, the more they feel like, why bother to do this at all? But I feel like there's a way in which, <coughs> because I was right to as a child, endlessly, because my mother would write me stories that my father would illustrate, because I still have a shelf of children's books that I was read as a very little boy before I could read, I feel like I owe all the people who stories that I read Oh, like in the Olympics, passing on the torch. And so there's something that I feel utterly compelled to do and, and have for many years to pass on the stories because so many stories were given. All right, thank you very much.